Hi guys, given the recent events in Hong Kong, we unfortunately may have to conduct our last few lectures online. Okay, but in any case, uh, for lecture nine, rather than start where we left off last time, I want to just start from the beginning. So for this lecture, there are two topics I would like to discuss with you. First, I want to talk about how one would go about investing in the market portfolio. And second, how one would evaluate whether the CAPM holds in reality or not. And lastly, uh, if CAPM does fail, how one would go about extending the CAPM uh, to better accurately measure uh, the required return on risky assets. Okay, so let's first start off by briefly reviewing the necessary assumptions in, for, for CAPM to hold. Okay, so let's first review that quickly. So the first three assumptions I'll write down on top here. So first, we are, for CAPM to hold, we have to assume that investors can buy and sell all assets with very little friction at competitive prices. So uh, there's basically infinite sellers, infinite buyers, and if you want to liquidate your position or you want to buy certain assets, it's very, very easy. So let me write investors can buy sell at competitive prices. Okay. Just meaning that there's very little transaction cost to buy and sell assets. Second, we are also assuming that investors hold efficient portfolios. So what that means is that we're assuming that investors have certain preferences such that they would prefer more returns and less risk. And risk is only measured in one dimension in terms of variance. Okay, And that's how one would map the efficient portfolio mathematics or the mean variance portfolio mathematics to CAPM. Okay? And lastly, we are assuming that investors all agree on what the mean returns and variance and covariances of all assets in the universe. In other words, we're assuming that investors have perfect information. Okay, so given these three assumptions, we then have the, me the mean variance portfolio mathematics uh, mapped over to the cap M. And so everybody's solving for that objective function. And from that math, we conclude that everyone is basically holding some form of the tangent portfolio. And from a macroeconomic perspective, when we aggregate everyone's portfolio, uh, essentially everyone is therefore just owning a piece of what's called the market portfolio, okay? The market portfolio is simply just the universe or the portfolio of the universe of assets that is available for all investors to hold, okay? So the questions I want to pose now is how do we actually go about investing in the market portfolio? And what does the captain have to say about beating the market? So we talked about, uh, we kind of understand what the captain is right now, right? It's the re to be strictly, to be as specific as possible, the CAPM basically gives you a model that, that tells you the, the expected rate of return for any asset, okay? So that's the required return on any assets. But what happens if you somehow get a better return? How will we go about measuring that? And what does it mean, okay? And lastly, if the CAPM is too strict, is there a way to extend it to get something useful? So that's where we extend it to uh, a model which maybe all of you have heard of called the Fama French four-factor model, okay? So let's first talk about how one would go about investing in the market portfolio, okay? Typical way uh, an investor would go about invest in uh, holding a portion of the market portfolio is by investing in mutual funds, okay? That's what typically what people do. Of course, you could construct it yourself, but of but usually, typically, that would cost you know a lot of time and resources, 
and additional fees and so forth. So most people would just opt to hold some form of a mutual fund. Okay, so mutual funds, again, is just a, a fund that holds many, many stocks. They may have different trading strategies. Uh, and the trading strategies typically fall into two categories. First, they may be considered active manager, managed funds. So for under those funds, they may not strictly follow a specific trading in or, or, or stock index, for example. What they do is they have some sort of uh, strategy to identify uh, identify inefficiencies in the market, okay? You can think about uh, maybe firms that have better fundamentals do better than firms that don't have such good fundamentals. That would be called, you know, fundamentals-based trading, okay? And these actively managed mutual funds typically have, therefore, higher fees because they want to be compensated for their somehow superior strategies, okay? So typically, their fees range from uh, one to fifteen percent, one to five percent. Sorry. On the other hand, many investors recently, for example, have considered putting holding the market portfolio through uh, putting their money in passively managed funds. So these are typically called index funds. Uh, so index funds just means they don't have a varying uh, strategy that changes over time. What they do is they simply track an index, such as the Hang Seng Index or the S&P 500, and therefore they don't need sophisticated uh, managers to come up with strategies. They simply follow a straightforward algorithm or mechanism, and so their fees are typically lower. Uh, so based on uh, my understanding, their fees typically range from five basis points to 30 basis points which is uh, in percentage points 0.05% to 0 0.3%, 3-0%, okay? So very, very low. Again, the reason why it's so low is because their strategy is simple. They don't need uh, any sophisticated execution uh, and so forth. Okay, so let's talk more about index funds since it's gaining, it's very, very popular, at least among institutional investors recently. Uh, so let me give you some examples. Uh, typical broad index funds in, in the U.S. are the Vanguard 500 Index Fund. It's actually the oldest retail index fund that tracks the S&P 500. In Hong Kong, we have the Hang Seng Composite Index that tracks roughly three, the top 300 listed firms by market cap. Again, market cap is simply the number of shares multiplied by uh, the price per share. Uh, of course, you can go broader. Uh, the U.S. in the U.S. Uh, the Vanguard 3000 index funds tracks the top 3,000 uh, firms by market cap. Likewise, the Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, we have the Hang Seng Global Composite Index that tracks about 2.1 thousand uh, firms. So, uh, of course, these are just indexes uh, for the Vanguard 3000. They actually track the Russell 3000, but there should be other mutual funds that track the Hang Seng Global Composite Index. Okay, so. This 2.1 thousand firms includes both Hong Kong firms and also firms abroad as well. Okay, uh, of course there are other types of index funds. For example, uh, they have, may have some. They may track index of particular characteristics of style. For example, I know that uh, Japan has a few index indexes that track uh, firms that have superior corporate governance and environmental social governance measures, such as being um, environmental friendly and so forth. Um, other firms such as BlackRock have strategies that trade on momentum. So they what momentum means that they typically would buy stocks that have gone up in the past and then sell those stocks that have gone down in the next period, investment period. Similarly, uh, the iShares quality, again, this is iShares is a product of BlackRock. For quality, they would buy stocks with strong fundamentals. So you can, fundamentals, again, we're talking about accounting variables such as Profitability, returns on assets, returns on equity, and so forth. Okay, so these are just examples of index funds that you might consider uh, constructing your market portfolio. All right, so two ways to typically invest in index funds. Uh, you, you could open a mutual fund vendor buy, or you can buy from them directly from them. Uh, mutual funds uh, typically 
uh, can sell you shares. They, they act like shares, but you can't trade it on the open market. You can only buy and sell from them. And it's, it's, so selling these shares back to these mutual funds is, is called actually called redeeming uh, your shares. So what you would actually do is uh, they would sell you at a price at a, that's determined at 9 p.m. typically. And the price is determined on uh, net asset value, which is equal to assets minus, minus liabilities. Okay, and it's typically determined at 9 p.m. At least in the U.S., okay? Secondly, rather than buy from mutual funds, you can buy uh, from other what's called index funds that are traded on the market. So these are called ETFs or exchange traded funds. Uh, they, these shares trade on, this, on the stock market just like any other stock, company stock. Uh, you can buy and sell and so forth and therefore it's more liquid. Okay, so you can just open a brokerage account and they have a ticker. You just buy that ticker or you sell that ticker just like any other stock. Okay, so just some summary statistics and some uh, over time of mutual funds and passive and active ownership in these mutual funds. So in this graph, I basically want to talk about or just mention that uh, investments in mutual funds has grown significantly over the past few years, especially after 2000. So in this graph, the y-axis is the percentage of uh, allocation of funds into U.S. equity. And we see that direct ownership of U.S. equity has been declining since 2000, whereas ownership of common equity through mutual funds, namely through open-end funds, has grown significantly since early 2000 and has, is continually, continuing to increase over time. So again, let me talk about what open-end funds means. Open-end funds just means that uh, you can always buy in. So what, if you decide to exit a fund and you decide to buy in again, you can. That's what open-end funds means. Closed-end funds, on the other hand, means that once you redeem your shares, you are not allowed to buy it. Okay? And lastly, the green line is ETFs. It has actually grown much, much larger recently. But as you can see, starting 2000, these kind of shares also started to get very popular. Or this way of invest, investing in equity is starting to get popular. Okay. In this slide, uh, we're talking about index funds. So we're talking about passive funds. In the previous slide, we we're talking about basically uh, any investments in mutual funds, and which has been growing over time. But investments specifically in index funds or mutual funds that track a particular index has also gained significant uh, growth. Okay. So again, starting from around early 2000s, we see that it has grown from roughly 4% up to 12%. In fact, I think this fraction is much, much higher, probably closer to 40% nowadays. Okay, now if we decide to break that distribution, this uh, aggregate measure down into components, uh, so what I've done here is broken it down to uh, by institutions. So the green line is the, is the total, is the overall public ownership of uh, passive, passively managed funds, index funds, okay? The red line is uh, direct contribution plans. So these are, uh, these are essentially uh, uh, in retirement funds that's managed by a company. And basically what the firm would do is they would uh, contribute along with you into a fund uh, so that when you decide to retire, uh, you have essentially some amount of money, okay? DB plans, the blue line, similar to DC plans, is also employee-based. So DB means defined benefits, but instead of a equity-based payout, you would get a fixed income, okay? 
And the dotted purple line is nonprofit holdings and passive strategy. So as you can see, uh, the overall public ownership in passive strategies has increased over time. And this passive ownership has remained, it's a large chunk of ownership by these institutions. Okay, so let's talk about alpha and market efficiency. So again, we're talking about ways in which the cap M will break now, okay? So, so to understand basically what alpha is, I think a best way to, to understand is to kind of find ways to misinterpret the cap M. So let's talk about the situation uh, where we want to get generate more returns, okay? So we can obviously generate more returns by simply, for example, forming a portfolio with 200% invested in the market portfolio, and then we short the risk-free rate. So given a beta of two, and we sh are shorting uh, the risk-free rate, we would get an excess returns of two times the, the risk premium, right? So the question is, did we just beat the market? Uh, so if you attended last week's lecture, uh, the answer is obviously no. The reason is because even though we are generating more income or more returns, we are now twice more exposed to the market factor or the market risk factor. Okay. So let me answer that question here. Do we just beat the market? No. Why? Because we have actually higher risk. So again, the model tells us the appropriate uh, trade-off between risk and return. If we generate more return and we gain more risk, we haven't beat the market because the, the model tells us that that is the appropriate exchange rate. Okay, So higher risk equals higher returns. So in other words, we are still working. within the cap in framework. Okay. All right, so simply generating a higher return is not a good measure of performance, right? We shouldn't just specifically only look at returns. We need to find a way to uh, measure our returns while controlling for risk. And the, the typical way uh, we approach this is define a benchmark. So our benchmark, therefore, is going to be the cap M implied return. Okay. So let's uh, first talk about how we go about estimating cap M. So remember from your econometrics. Are we will use OLS to estimate beta, and we do so by estimating the following model, where alpha is the constant term plus beta RM minus RF, which is the market risk premium, plus the error term. And we know, and we have, we are assuming that the error term is going to be normally distributed with variance sigma squared and mean zero, okay? And so we go about estimating alpha. So hat here means estimation by taking the difference between the mean realized return, excess returns. So that's what ri minus rf bar means. It's the mean observed excess returns minus the model predicted return. Okay, so we have our estimated beta times Rm minus Rf. Again, this is a mean measure. Okay, and we can reformulate this to look like what we have in the bottom here. Okay, so let me just move things around. Beta hat Rm minus Rf. Okay, so this equation here will match exactly this equation here, okay? And so one would typically write this sometimes as y 
bar minus beta hat x. Okay, so x is therefore our independent variable and y bar is our mean observed outcome variable, or in this case, uh, excess returns. Okay, so hopefully, so let's review a little bit. So alpha is defined as the observed, ex observed expected returns minus the predicted expected returns by CAPM. So remember, CAPM tells us the precise relationship between risk and return. But if somehow the return generates more than what's predicted by CAPM, then we would generate positive alpha. Okay. Okay, so what does that look like? So let's talk about the case. So let's try to understand alpha using some examples here, okay? So in this case, we assume that there is some news that's coming up out about GM, IBM, ExxonMobil, and Anheuser-Busch. So a little background, GM is a car company, IBM is an IT conglomerate, ExxonMobil is an oil company, Anheuser-Busch is a uh, beer company, alcohol company. Okay, let's assume that there's good news uh, about from GM and there's good news for ExxonMobil. Why is it good news? Because for the same risk, for the same level of risk, we see that GM is increasing. Same with ExxonMobil, but we have bad news for IBM. So IBM's, for the same risk, IBM's returns are going down, whereas also Anheuser-Busch's returns is going down. So remember, we're not we're assuming that prices are unchanged, but the beliefs about GM and IBM's returns and ExxonMobil and Anheuser-Busch's return has changed because of news, right? News that's beyond the, the control of investors and therefore unpredictable, unpredicted, cannot be predicted. Okay, so what does that look like on the SML line or the securities market line? So remember the securities market line is plotting the relationship between beta and expected returns. Okay, so what this tells us is that uh, because IBM, so because GM and ExxonMobil has uh, now generating more returns, uh, they're they are now considered undervalued. Okay, so remember anything above the line is undervalued. And anything below is overvalued. Okay, so if something is undervalued, then we need to bid up the price higher. And when we bid up the price higher, returns will go back to equilibrium. So if we so one would one would actually bid up the price higher if you believe that in the long run, uh, the CAPM model is going to be correct, right? So in that case, we should expect uh, we should expect GM to approach the green red line in the future. Okay. Uh, so if one were to short, sorry, if some one were to buy this asset today, they can sell at a higher price tomorrow, and in doing so. Uh, it will, this will generate profit, right? Because you can sell it at the equilibrium price as ex determined by CAPM. So this is considered positive alpha. Same with ExxonMobil, it's going to be positive alpha. Uh, but on the other hand, any firm below the security capital market line is considered overvalued. So uh, you, if you, again, if you expect CAPM to hold in the long run, you can short it and shorting it will make the prices go down and that would make returns higher in the future. Okay, so this is uh, called negative alpha. Okay, so that's the logic of undervalued, overvalued and the relationship with alpha, positive alpha and negative alpha. Okay, so, uh, so where is this positive alpha coming from?
is coming from a violation of number three, right? Our third assumption, what we discussed in the beginning in the first two slides. We assume that there's perfect information, but at some point triggered a disagreement And that's why we have positive alpha, right? Somebody had uh, privileged information and they decided to exploit it and they generated positive alpha. Okay, so let's talk about, so this is kind of a segue to discussing how we would go about breaking the CAPM assumptions. So, Typically, we don't talk about the first two assumptions because they're hard to test, but the information dimension assumption of CAPM, we can certainly test uh, fairly well with uh, corporate events, okay? So, to review, the third assumption is saying that basically we have efficient markets, okay? And the efficient market hypothesis tells us that all securities will be fairly priced given all publicly available information. This basically underlies, uh, is underlie, underlies our assumption that investors are very competitive. And as soon as information is released, these investors will react and therefore they'll make their trades to exploit their privileged information and prices will incorporate the new information as soon as possible. Okay, so that's the typical rationale for why efficient markets are, should exist. Okay, um, whether or not this is true is, is debatable, okay? And in, in fact, it may hold under various contexts, which we will talk about. Uh, but regardless, this is kind of a typical benchmark uh, that, we that we would use to understand market efficiency, okay? So much like so in economics, as you will know, we always start from uh, as, as very strong assumptions, and then we start to relax to kind of understand the frictions that prevent markets from being fully efficient. Okay, so the classic definitions of market efficiency can be broken down into three forms, okay? And these come from uh, two classic papers, Fama, 1970, who, who basically uh, define market efficiency as prices fully reflect all of available information. Jensen extends this definition to say that a market is efficient if it is impossible to make excess profits by trading on all available information. Okay, so the debate is actually what, how we go about defining all available information. And given this uh, definition, we can actually break this information set into three types, right? We can, let's talk about the most st strict form, okay? So strong form of efficiency is basically saying that uh, nobody has privileged information, all private information. There's no such thing as private information. Um, and therefore, markets are perfectly efficient, and therefore, the only risk factor should be the market portfolio, and alpha should always be zero. Nobody should be able to generate information. Okay? Semi-strong form of efficiency, on the other hand, allows for private information to exist. So what semi-strong form of efficiency tells us is that you could actually read, uh, you can't make any money reading uh, the newspaper, for example, but you can make money with privileged information. So you can think about insider trading. If you are a manager of a company and you know that there's good news coming out for your company, you can actually go, I mean, you can generate, definitely generate alpha by simply buying uh, your own shares of your company and then sell it once the news is released, okay? So what semi-strong form efficiency is telling us is that, uh, for example, we can't generate alpha by reading the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Journal. So let me write that down. Reading Wall Street Journal does not, doesn't work. Okay. Uh, weak form efficiency, on the other hand, says that uh, you can actually make money by, from reading newspapers. Okay, so maybe because some people may read faster than the others, it's entirely possible. Uh, but you still can't make money through historical information. So what the weak form efficiency is telling us is that technical analysis
doesn't work. So let me review a bit. So starting from weak form efficiency, we're saying that maybe there are some frictions, maybe some people can read newspapers faster than the others. Uh, that's fine. So you can go long once a newspaper go long once a newspaper mentions a positive news about a stock, and there may be some frictions in which the market incorporates that information, and you can still generate positive alpha. But weak for efficiencies tells us that past information doesn't tell us any anything new. Okay, because that price has already incorporated that information uh, in the past. Okay, so in other words, if you tr start to draw trend lines and stuff, technical analysis on average will not generate any money. Okay, namely buying, for example, buying uh, good performing stocks today and selling them tomorrow, or shorting poor performing stocks today and then buying them back uh, in the future. Semi-strong form efficiency tells us that uh, both past information and present information is incorporated into the stock price. So you can't make, you can't generate positive alpha by simply reading the newspaper. So reading the Wall Street Journal doesn't work. But you can still make money from exploiting private information, which leads to our strong form efficiency. Strong form efficiency says that uh, all information is, is uh, perfect. So that means everybody knows everything. Everybody knows what everybody else knows. So there is no segmented uh, different, different information sets. Everybody has the same information sets. And therefore, no, and therefore market prices should always reflect uh, that information set. In those circumstances, alpha must be zero. Okay. Okay, so what... From a market, from an information perspective, we now can understand what alpha means. So alpha tells us that there, a positive alpha tells us that prices do not fully reflect all available information. Okay, positive alpha means that the market is efficient, and basically there may be barriers to entry into the stock market, for example, or maybe there's something wrong with CAPM. Maybe we made wrong assumptions such as the CAPM does not describe all undiversifiable risks. So there may be frictions in w that may prevent us, prevent investors from fully diversifying uh, diversifiable risk or limiting diversifiable risk. So at the end of the day, in order to test market efficiency, we have to dig in the data. Okay? And so we have to kind of understand how stocks returns are predicted. Can we predict stock returns? And so we're going to try to predict stock returns in, in three ways. Okay? We're going to try to uh, analyze stock returns in the short run, in which we only look at stock returns from a day-to-day -day basis or a few days. Uh, we're going to also going to try to predict stock returns in the medium run. Are stocks predictable over a period of a few months? And then we're going to look at long-run predictab predictability. Are stock returns predictable over a period of several years? Uh, so, so, so to briefly summarize, basically on a day-to-day -day basis, stock returns are very, very difficult to predict. In fact, I'll show you a picture in which there's basically no correlation whatsoever between today's prices, or today's returns, and tomorrow's returns. On the other hand, for number two and number three, over the median run and long run predictability, there's still, it, the data suggests that it may be possible to actually generate alpha. Okay, it, it really depends on who you are, and so I'll give you some examples. Okay, so let's look at the short run predictability. So these are just uh, based on Fama's 1965 paper, and so he just looks at one day changes from today compared with tomorrow, and and calculated the correlation coefficient uh, for four days, for nine days, for sixteen days. In general, the correlation or the autocorrelation is basically zero, as you can see. So one day change, 0 0.03, four day, nine day change around 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 16 days, 0 0.01. So very, very close to zero, basically saying that there's no correlation whatsoever. So if, you, if we look at the, uh, the correlation plot, if we just do a scatter plot of the one day returns, we see that it's basically very difficult to 
find a best fit line. If you draw a regression, we have no idea whether or not it looks like this, looks like this. We have no idea. I mean, there is no best fit line, okay? So maybe here a little bit, but still it's hard to tell, right? It's, it's as if I just threw uh, some, some paint on the wall, okay? It's basically unpredictable on a day-to-day -day basis. On the other hand, medium to long run predictability, there's a lot of papers that actually show that you could actually make some money uh, by buying good performing stocks today and shorting poor performing stocks today and then selling them or buying them back in the future. Okay, So like the seminal paper that uh, showed that momentum strategy actually worked is by Jagadish and Titman, 1993. And he studied the serial correlation of returns over six to 12 months following the following strategy. They buy stocks that have high returns over the last 12 months, and then they sell, sell short the stocks that have low returns over the 12 past months. And they seem to have produced an alpha of about 12% over their time period. Of course, over time, once anybody mentions a trading strategy, everybody will be doing it. And once everybody is doing it, that alpha will disappear naturally. So, uh, so over recent studies, I think it's still positive alpha, but just not as high as 12%. Okay. Okay. So we can actually also think about uh, market efficiency by analyzing, uh, analyzing news events, uh, corporate events. So if we really think that the market is fully efficient, and in the sense of the information, we kind of expect the market to react to announcements immediately, right? That's why there's a solid vertical line here. Okay, that's basically saying that the market understands precisely what the information is uh, and therefore, therefore just jumps to the price target immediately, instantaneously. Uh, of course, we are all, we're not robots, okay? Pe we have humans that are trading, uh, and so humans are always uncertain, or they may make mistakes, or there's always uncertainty that humans don't process correctly, and so we may get an overreaction or an underreaction. So overreaction just means that people may be too enthusiastic about a piece of news information, but then they realize that they have overreacted, so then there's a subsequent... Uh, uh, reversion of stock prices. Okay, so you can imagine uh, maybe a firm did well during an EPS uh, earnings announcement. Okay, and they beat their target. People may typically, typically, if you have a, if you think it's a behavioral story, maybe people are over enthusiastic about certain news. We c we could expect an overreaction in the stock market price, and once individuals or investors realize that they overreacted to the news there is a subsequent correction or uh, reversal in stock prices. On the other hand, we may also get an underreaction. So a delayed reaction is equivalent to saying there's an underreaction. Uh, what this means is that maybe not the entire information is fully processed by the markets. Uh, there may be some sort of disagreement. And so there is a slow release of, as it looks as if there's a slow release of information over time, okay? And so observing an overreaction, underreaction will tell us that, yes, there are informational frictions in the market, and therefore CAPM most likely doesn't hold at all times. But maybe on average, it looks like there is a uh, efficient market, but we'll see. It depends on the context. So I'll basically, what I want to kind of some, give you a broad overview of what I'm going to present. I'm going to present a series of examples in which uh, tells you that if firstly tells you that it looks like CAPM, the information, the efficient market hypothesis, doesn't hold uh, by presenting you these uh, corporate events announcements. But on the other hand, when we look at performance of actively managed funds, they will actually perform a lot worse than the benchmark uh, CAPM, right? The market portfolio. Um, but the conclusion here is to show you that. It, this topic of market efficiency is still actively debated and it's still out in the open whether or not markets are fully efficient.
So let's look at a typical example of information uh, release corporate, uh, from arising from a corporate event. So let's look at the case of uh, a takeover. So this is a merger. Um, so Bradley, Desai, and Kim wrote a paper talk analyzing cumulative abnormal returns in response to uh, merger announcements. Okay, so cumulative abnormal returns is simply just summing uh, alphas. You can think of it as just summing alphas over a period of time. So in this case, they went back six days. So what they do is they sum the alphas uh, i equals negative six to 60, okay? So minus six days to 60 days, they add up the alphas or the excess re or the abnormal returns. So again, abnormal returns just means returns above and beyond a benchmark. And let's assume the benchmark here is cap M. Uh, and the typical, what we typically would believe is that uh, under perfect markets, perfect information, uh, when there's no news, alpha should be zero. But upon release of news, we should see a basically a, a sharp vertical uprise at time zero. And, uh, and that price would stay constant over time, uh, conditional that no other events occur within that window. So based on takeover announcement, it seems that on average, markets are seemingly quite efficient, right? We see that prior to the announcement, uh, alpha, the cumulative abnormal returns are zero. But once we get to around zero, in fact, there seems to be some information leakage, but it's, it's very, very minor, right? Because it's, it's hard to pinpoint precisely when information is released. But in any case, we see a sharp increase in the cumulative abnormal returns, and it stays stable over time. So on average, it seems like when it comes to takeover events, uh, takeover announcements, uh, markets are quite efficient in, in absorbing the information. Of course, this doesn't, of course, this doesn't, uh, it's not always efficient for every case. In the case in which uh, there's still some degree of uncertainty once an announcement occurs. For example, once you announce that you would buy a firm, the deal may not actually follow through. So if you look at the yellow line, the yellow line tells us that, uh, yes, there is a pricing of information at time zero, but there is still uncertainty about whether or not the deal will complete. So we see a slow reversal, right? Because information is doesn't arise uh, at time zero. There may be you, the investors learn more about the deal over time, and so once the investors absorb that information, uh, the cumulative abnormal returns approaches to zero. Okay. On the other hand, we have the other case in which uh, the the deal actually completes, uh, as you can see. Uh, there is an under there's, there is again an underreaction because again there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding uh, the completion of this takeover, and so we see that the price does increase at zero at time zero, but the full the full uh, capturing of the value created from this takeover is not absorbed until sixty days later after the announcement. But on average, the point here, however, is that on average it seems like the market is quite efficient uh, when it comes to uh, absorbing information with regards to takeover bids. Okay, so that's one event. Uh, but what about just information that's transmitted from television personalities? So in the United States, uh, there are lots and lots of stock pitchers and stock pickers, uh, especially an individual named Jim Cramer likes to sometimes uh, make suggestions to buy certain stocks simply based on his own personal preference, okay? Again, to make sure Jim Craner is not biased, he's not allowed to actually, I mean, manipulate markets, he's not actually allowed to make any direct investments in these companies that he's pitching. But in any case, uh, uh, he basically, we basically divide Jim, or the authors, Engelberg, Sassville, and Williams basically divide his stock pitches into types of categories. One category is which he pitches a stock, either to buy or to sell, uh, based on some news event. And 
other pitches in which his pitches are based on no news. Okay, as you can see, uh, there is some behavioral bias here. Uh, both stock seems to react. Sorry, both both uh, both type of stock pitches seem to generate cumulative abnormal returns at time zero. So in fact, so in fact, if you actually go about buying whenever buying the stock in which Jim Cranor actually proposes, you would actually generate positive alpha at time zero, but you would have to sell it immediately on average. Um, so there is an obvious overreaction in the case of no news, which is uh, somewhat strange, right? So this must be a behavioral problem. Information is not fully transmitted and a sure sign that there is some market manipulation going on, okay? So again, no news means there's no actual information being transmitted to the markets. This is just Jim Cramer arbitrarily proposing uh, to buy or sell a certain stock. On the other hand, uh, for the news, we see that uh, markets are quite efficient. But what's troubling, or what seems counterintuitive, uh, or seems to counter the prevailing assumption of perfect information in CAPM is this overreaction on the stock in response to no news. Again, uh, to remind you, the y-axis is cumulative abnormal returns. We're just summing the actual, actual realized returns uh, minus the benchmark return, which is the implied expected returns from CAPM. And then we're just adding it over time. Okay. Okay, so from that, it seems like there's some inefficiency going on. Information doesn't seem like it's fully, or even false information seems like it's being transmitted through the markets. Uh, but let's look at some a more typical event. Let's look at earnings announcement. So based on this graph, so let me briefly describe what this is. Uh, these are earnings announcements from US companies from 1988 to 2002. Uh, these colored lines are based on how well they beat or underperformed against uh, consensus. So we're talking about the median uh, EPS, uh, the median EPS prediction by analysts. Okay, so the the light blue line. The light blue line is our firms that significantly outperform the median analyst EPS forecast, and the red line are uh, firms in which the are firms earnings announcements in which their EPS fell below the most uh, from the median of the analyst forecast. Okay, so as you can see, what the level doesn't really matter so much. What what I'm what I want to show here or try to emphasize here is that. Uh, the trend lines here are not, there's no sharp discontinuity at time zero, okay? So remember, this is time zero. So let me emphasize here, this is time zero. Two, two things to note here is that first, f even from a few days ahead, there seems to be some leakage of information. So that just means that there's private and there's a difference between private and public information, right? There's two, at least two sets of information. At time zero, there's no sharp increase. So markets already know, kind of predict, kind of know what's going on. Um, but there is an underreaction. So it's, but there's uncertainty. So it seems like the market doesn't fully know what's going on until maybe 30 days out, right? Up to here. So there is a, uh, trend either going down or going up, depending if it outperformed or underperformed the consensus forecasts. Uh, but in any case, this is a underreaction, and again, tell, again tells us that there are informational frictions within the market, and therefore CAPM most likely doesn't hold, and it's problematic at least for uh, portfolio managers and so forth. I mean, from an asset pricing point of view. So if we dive down a little bit deeper into earnings announcement and look further back, uh, again, the time zero line is here. So 
if we go even further back, this kind of shows that there is a leakage of information even starting all the way back from day beyond day 60. Okay. Again, we're looking at cumulative excess returns. So uh, to be clear, excess return typically we say excess returns uh, to mean that we are subtracting from a benchmark that's from a secure from a uh, from actual security, such as the 10-year treasury yield. And we designate abnormal returns to mean uh, from a model implied benchmark. So let me write that down. So excess returns, uh, returns above some risk, typically a risk-free asset return. Uh, sorry, return. And abnormal return is return above or below uh, model implied. Sorry, model implied benchmark. Okay, so let's let's move on. So um, we talked about one way to analyze market efficiency. We look at uh, market efficiency with respect to inf presenting of information coming from uh, you know stock pictures, TV personalities, and also from corporate events, but. We can also analyze market efficiency from the performance side uh, of investors. And we can do that by comparing basically mutual funds that actively try to generate alpha by outperforming a, the market implied benchmark and compare that with mutual funds that simply track the market itself right through an index. And so let's look at that now. Okay, so let's look at uh, market efficiency from the investor side. Can they beat the market, is what I'm saying. In other words, can they generate positive alpha? So let's just look at performance of equity of mutual funds versus the S&P 500. So this is the returns, okay? On the left-hand side, we're looking at fund returns or index returns, and the x-axis is our timeline. The green or blue bars are returns of the typical, the mean mutual fund, and the red bars are the market, the S&P 500. As you can see, it looks like for some years, the market seems to outperform the mutual funds, but in other years, sometimes mutual funds beat the market. Sometimes the mutual funds lose a lot more than the funds. But again, based on our understanding of CAPM, just looking at returns is not a good way to analyze performance. We have to be find a way to control for risk. So. We will do that by calculate, actually calculating the alpha of uh, these mutual funds, okay? The green bars. So looking at actively mutual fund alphas, so again, on the y-axis, average alpha annual, we're talking about a benchmark. We're gonna, uh, typically, we typically use the CAPM as the benchmark, okay? We see that the alphas for all types of these actively managed funds have negative alpha. So aggressive growth means that they're heavily in focused on uh, you know, technology firms, firms that are expected to generate a lot of growth in the future, but again, there's a lot of risk. Same with growth, growth funds. Growth and income just means there is some diversification into dividend paying stocks. Balance, even balance and incomes, safe stock seems to underperform relative to the CAPM benchmark, okay? And the red bar here is the average alpha for all mutual funds. So from this graph, it seems like actually from performance-wise, markets seem quite efficient. Very few opportunities to generate alpha on average. 
Another way of evaluating whether or not there are market inefficiencies is actually to look at the performance of institutional fund managers themselves. So let me briefly explain what this study was trying to accomplish. So in this study, they identified uh, uh, pension fund managers that had superior performance prior to a hiring date, a promotion date. So in this graph, we have excess returns over a benchmark on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we have a timeline where the, it's represents, each point represents years relative to a hiring date. So as you can see, these pension fund managers perform very well prior to the hiring date, but afterwards they generate excess returns that are basically close to zero. And so there are several explanations for why this occurs. Uh, the market inefficiency explanation is that, first of all, it's possible that these selected fund managers simply were just lucky. Uh, they were probably lucky within the previous three years and generated excess returns about 3.5% above the benchmark. And after their promotion, they just perform as normal as any, everyone else and basically generate zero excess returns. An alternative explanation is also that these pension fund managers were probably working with a much smaller portfolio. And working with a much smaller portfolio and after being promoted to manage a, a larger fund, they probably weren't able to scale their strategies beforehand. And so after scaling, as you, as you know, it's as if everyone is, uh, is as if you have more individuals who are trying to implement the same strategy, trading strategies, and therefore when you have multiple people doing the same thing, alphas and excess returns tends to converge to zero. Okay. Uh, a third explanation probably was maybe also be possible. It's possible that these institutional fund managers are just being more entrenched. So once they are hired to a more powerful position, they may just be lazier, and therefore uh, they just they just work less hard on generating excess returns. And so actually, this may not be a story about market inefficiency, but more of about an inefficiency in the market for managers. So uh, managers aren't well incentivized, and so once you promote them, they just become lazy and underperform. All right, so moving on from institutional fund managers, we can also look at hedge fund strategies. Um, from this study, we see that actually compared to pension fund managers, mutual fund managers, alphas actually, sorry, hedge funds seem to also generate, uh, are contrary to these other funds, hedge funds tend to outperform the market. So the, the white, bars represent uh, returns generated by the market, whereas the gray bars represent alphas generated by uh, hedge funds on average. So let me briefly talk about the graph first. So again, the y-axis is returns. Uh, so these are risk-adjusted returns, uh, but note that they are, they, these returns are not net of fees. So this is prior to fees, uh, hedge fund fees. The x-axis is years, okay? So 1998, we see that hedge funds actually underperform the market, and this is, pro this is mainly because a big hedge fund based collapsed on itself. Uh, called, the hedge fund was called long-term capital management. So there was a, uh, they were essentially over leveraged and they were too exposed to currency risk, the collapse of the ruble, uh, the Russian ruble, and therefore, you know, had to be bailed out by the U.S. government. So that's why you see a large decline in alpha, uh, in alpha for 1998. But for the other years, it seems that hedge funds tend to outperform fairly well, even in, during the economic crisis of 2007-2008, compared to the market portfolio. Okay, so hedge funds seems to be the outlier. They seem to outperform the market. So it seems, so it does seem possible uh, that someone can beat the market and markets are completely efficient. All right, so I wanna conclude this lecture quickly, uh, briefly talking about multi-factor models of risk and return. So we talked about one, one model uh, so far in this class, which is the CAPM, and the CAPM naturally assumes that there is under very strong assumptions, there should only be one source of risk. And that risk factor is determined by the correlations across all assets within the market portfolio. Uh, these, uh, these assumptions are naturally very extreme. And of course, 
CAPM, and based on most empirical studies, have suggested that there are ways to generate alpha or returns above and beyond what is predicted by CAPM. And so what researchers have tried to do is try to introduce new factors to kind of eliminate alphas. Um, and these multi-factor models are very, are very simple. They're just linear extensions of the CAPM model. So as you know, the CAPM model is just a linear function uh, between the CAPM factor, which is the market portfolio factor with respect to returns. And we simply extend this model by tagging on additional factors linearly. So there's additional betas associated to other returns that it's generated from a particular trading strategy. So we'll talk about uh, the Fama French three factor augmented with the Carhartt momentum factor. So let's talk about the Fama French three factor first. So the Fama, free, Fama French three factors are size, uh, value, and the, the market risk factor, okay? So they augmented the cap M with two additional factors. And so what Fama French uncovered in their seminal paper is that if you, decide, if you sort firms based on size, that is market capitalization, smaller firms tend to outperform large firms. So based on this graph, we see that if we decide to partition our portfolio of firms to small to large, whereas the red dots symbolize small firms and the blue dots symbolize big firms, uh, there is positive alpha associated to these smaller firms. So let me emphasize that the distance between this, uh, this solid line and actual realized monthly excess returns is alpha. Similarly, Fama French also sorted portfolios based on value. So they defined value as book to market. So value is equal to book value. Uh, so book value is, again, is shareholder equity. divided by market value. So market value, again, is just market cap. So what this means is that uh, firms with high book to market value, Fama French is suggesting that these firms are undervalued. Okay? That means that their stock price is probably low, but they have a lot of tangible assets, and so there's probably a, some degree of undervaluation and these firms should generate positive alpha. So again, the red dots symbolize growth firms, meaning that their stock value may be a little bit exaggerated. And so their book to value ratio is lower compared to those with uh, uh, small market value, right? In that sense, their value measure would be large. So those are the blue dots. So again, once you sort your portfolios based on value, we see that firms with high value tend to generate positive alpha. Okay, so augmenting the CAPM with these two factors. So what they do is they short growth firms, go long on value firms, short small, sorry, go long on small firms and then short large firms they can generate a portfolio return and use that as part of their regression to estimate uh, the three-factor model. Okay? Similarly, Carhartt extends the three-factor model with a momentum portfolio. So what the momentum portfolio is that they buy past year's winners and sell last year's losers. Okay? So in the end, we get a augmented CAPM model with three additional factors. The small minus big factor, again, small minus big, meaning that we are selling uh, large firms and then going long on small firms. And also we are including a high minus low factor. So high minus low just means that we are shorting growth firms and going long on value firms. And lastly, we have a momentum factor. Momentum factor, again, refers to shorting past 
losers and going long on past winners. Okay. So if you don't feel comfortable with just using CAPM in your valuation, that's fine. You can go ahead and try to estimate these betas yourself. But I believe that you can actually find all these betas on uh, uh, French's website. So you just Google it yourself. All right, so let me briefly summarize what I covered in this lecture. So in this lecture, I talked about how to actually go about investing in the market portfolio. You can actually go about by you know buying these set of portfolio set of stocks yourselves, or if you want, if you realize that there's actually a lot of transaction costs actually going out and buying these stocks, you can just invest directly in mutual funds. And two types of mutual funds: ma actively managed mutual funds and passively managed mutual funds. Uh, if you want to just capture the entire market portfolio, you should just stick with a mutual fund that follow, tracks the index, such as the S&P 500. Uh, and lastly, I talked about quantifying or test basically ways to evaluate whether or not CAPM assumptions hold. And we focused on uh, one of the dimension, one of the assumptions of CAPM, which is perfect information. And so uh, I presented you with a set of evidence that supports perfect, basically, uh, efficient market efficiency of uh, capturing or incorporating information into prices, but I also presented evidence against it. So at the end of the day, it's a mixed bag. It's we still this is still actively debated among academics, and so future research is obviously still can being conducted. Uh, and lastly, I introduced a multi-factor model. So if you're not comfortable with CAPM, you can simply estimate a multi-factor model of risk to get a perhaps a more accurate measure of the required risk, rate of return for risky assets. Uh, but for valuation purposes, CAPM is typically sufficient. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and leave a comment or send me an email. Uh, I will finish up next week's lecture uh, in another separate video. All right, thanks for listening.